Good day everyone. For today's video, I will be discussing the analysis of different fingerprint characteristics and formation. So, I will be discussing first the allied sciences in fingerprinting, followed by the pattern interpretations, and of course, the pipelines and the pattern area, and likewise, the two focal points of fingerprinting wherein I will be discussing also in this particular topic the rules in locating the delta and rules in locating the core. To begin with, before we start with the interpretations and analysis of the pattern formations, we are going to discuss the allied sciences. When we talk about allied sciences, these are uh, studies which are connected or related with fingerprinting. First is we have here the dactylography. This is actually the scientific study of fingerprints as a means of identification. Next is dactyloscopy. This is actually a practical application of fingerprints wherein it involves the uh, making of personal identification through the fingerprint comparison and the classification of fingerprints and the uh, dactyloscopy came from the word from the Greek word dactylos which means finger and the word scopian meaning watch there are actually some who are confused between the dactylography and dactyloscopy. In, they are actually both the study of fingerprints as a means of identification. What makes dactyloscopy different from dactylography is that it involves comparison. Just like this... Uh, uh, two fingerprints wherein it is being compared from one another. These two prints actually came from a study comparison of twins wherein if you are going to compare the fingerprints of the twins, it is different. So this uh, method is actually under the study of the philosophy. Aside from comparison, dactyloscopy also involves classification of fingerprints for the uh, identification of the person. Moving on with the allied sciences of fingerprinting, we have here radiology. So this is actually the science that actually deals with the study of horoscopy Egescopy and rich characteristics for the purpose of positive identification of fingerprints. So, this particular poroscopy is a method of personal identification through the comparison of the impressions of sweat pores which are present on the friction ridges of palmar and the plantar surfaces. And this actually uh, was developed by Edmund Lockhart in 1912. Next is we also have here the egescopy, which includes the study of the uh, study of the sides or edges of the papillary ridges. Okay, so this two studies are actually under radiology. Next is we have here the podoscopy, which is the science of identification or the scientific examination or study through the friction ridge characteristics which are existing on the sole of the human foot. And uh, the father of podoscopy is actually Edmond Lockhart, who is a forensic scientist and popularly regarded as the uh, Sherlock Holmes of France. 
So you see, if you're going to observe, the study of the friction ridges is not on the hands, but it is also with the entire sole of the feet. Next is we have here the chiroscopy, wherein it is the scientific identification through the friction ridge characteristics which are actually existing on the palm of the human hand. Let us now proceed with our next topic which is the pattern interpretations. In the interpretation of the fingerprint patterns, it involves the ridge characteristics and these characteristics includes individual formation of the ridges and these ridges may actually appear in the friction skin in different shape or form. Moreover, in the uh, characteristics, it includes the class characteristics and the individual characteristics. When we say class characteristics, these are characteristics that actually narrows the print down to a particular group but not an individual so take note that it narrows the print down to a particular group such as the three fingerprint class types which are the arch the loops and the words on the other hand when we talk about the individual characteristics it uh, is called the minutiae where in it involves the number of ridges and their groupings that are not perceptible to the naked eye. Wherein it includes the, uh, or it may also include the uh, tiny irregularities that appears within the friction ridges, which are actually referred to as the Galton details. And uh, the most common types of the Galton details are actually the bifurcation, the ridge endings, and the dots or islands, wherein it will be discussed later on when we interpret the different pattern formations. First ridge formation is we have here the recurving ridge. It is actually a ridge that curves back in the direction from where it started. As we can see in the figure, we have here the recurving ridge. I would suggest that for you to be familiar with this ridge formation, it is better if you are going to practice to draw these formations. We have here the recurving ridge. Okay? It curves back in the direction from where it started. Our next ridge formation is we have here the converging ridge. This is actually a ridge formation whose close end is angular and serve as a point of convergence. So these ridges are actually uh, pointed and these are uh, actually two ridges, this one. Two ridges wherein they meet at a particular point and then form an angle. In other words, these are two or more lines which forms an angle. So here it is. Okay. So these are two ridges wherein they meet at a particular point and then form an angle. So this is our angle and this is called the converging ridge. Next is we have here the diverging ridge. It says there, uh, these are two ridges, for example this one, wherein they flow parallel to each other and then upon reaching a particular point, they begin to diverge or separate, wherein one ridge is going to one way and the other is going to the other way. So here. I repeat, when you want to be familiarized with this uh, ridge formation, it is better if you are going to draw on your own. Next on our ridge formation is we have here the bifurcation ridge or known as the bifurcation. 
It is actually a single ridge wherein it splits into two ridges, forming a Y-shaped structure or more branches. Sometimes this is referred to as a fork. Okay, this one. We have here the bifurcation. However, sometimes when you encounter that it has three branches, for instance, this one, the three branches, okay, this is known as the uh, trifurcation, okay? So, we, another example is we also have here the, uh, we have here the bifurcation, here, we have here the bifurcation, this one. Next would be the double bifurcation. Okay. Double bifurcation looks like this. Okay. If you're going to observe, we have here first bifurcation. Mm -hmm. Wait for a while. There, we have here the uh, first bifurcation. And the second bifurcation. I hope you are following with the uh, with my pointer. We have here we have the second bifurcation. Okay, this one. So this particular part, we have two bifurcations. That is considered as the double bifurcation. Next would be the opposed bifurcation. Okay. From the word alone, opposed. We have here the opposed bifurcation. This one, I will be highlighting this. They are opposed to one another. Two bifurcations which are opposed from one another. This is the opposed bifurcation. Again, so we have different types of bifurcations. We have here the bifurcation. It is a single ridge wherein it is uh, a single ridge that splits into two forming a Y shape. We have here the trifurcation wherein it is a single ridge and it splits into three. And we have here the double bifurcation wherein it is a single ridge forming two bifurcations. And of course, we have here the opposed bifurcation. Okay, so next would be the enclosure or known as the eyelet, the lake or an eye. It is actually a single ridge and then it bifurcates where the bifurcating ridges converge at a certain point from uh, at a certain point in order to form a single ridge. Okay, so we have there the enclosure, eyelet, lake or eye. Okay, there. So, aside from that, of course, we have here the uh, other drawings or picture of the enclosure or the lake or the islet. So, another is actually the island. A single, uh, a single small ridge inside a short ridge or a ridge ending which is not connected with other ridges. So, in other words, this is the... Uh, ridge formation that can stand alone so it is not attached or connected with any other ridges for example this one okay these are considered as an island or an island okay so remember when we talk about island it could either be a, la a dot or a short ridge okay as long as it is not connected with the other ridges. Next here is the fragmentary ridges. From the word alone, fragments. These are uh, disconnected sequences of short ridges with the embodied intents. So it is considered in the classification of fingerprints. Take note if they appear as dark and thick as the uh, surrounded ridges with the pattern area so for example this one they appear as thick or as dark as the surrounded ridges so they are considered as the uh, fragmentary ridges 
Okay, so uh, when we talk about short ridges, of course, it contains a single ridge. It talks about uh, only one ridge, a short ridge, like this one. Now, uh, when we talk about series of short ridges, these are fragmentary ridges, which are formed by short or series of short ridges. Of course, more than... Uh, when we say a series or fragmentary ridges, it contains not only one ridge but a series or more than two ridges okay next is we have here the dots or series of dots okay when we talk about that no s okay it, it is a single dot or a dot ridge However, when we talk about dots or series of dots, of course, these are fragmentary ridges formed like a dot or dots, just like this one. Next here is the incipient or the nascent ridge. It is the kind of ridge wherein it is madly formed. It is a thin or uh, tiny, short or broken which appears or appears in the depression between two well-formed ridges. Just like on the illustration, these are the nascent. They are in between the two well-formed ridges, as shown in the picture. Next is we have here the ridge ending or the ending ridge. Of course, from the word itself, ending, this is the uh, termination or uh, the ending of a ridge or the ridges. Just like on the picture here, there, these are considered as the ending ridge. It is where the uh, re ridges ended, or it is the termination of ridges. Okay, so next is we have here the ridge hook or the spur. It is a ridge wherein it divides to form to form two ridges which are shorter in length than the main ridge. In other words, it's like a hook. Okay, the main ridge is uh, larger okay, than the other one. Just like here, in the picture. Okay, we have here the uh, the spur is smaller than the main ridge. Okay. So, of course, next is we have here the ridge bridge. This is a connecting ridge between the two ridges there. Or it forms a letter H. Next is a shoulder of a loop. So, it is the point at which the recurving ridge definitely turns or they eventually curve. It's like on what you have you are seeing now on the screen we have here examples so the uh, shoulder of a loop is this one if you can see my arrow there the yellow one this is considered as the shoulder of a loop there okay. so it is definitely the part at which this uh, recurving or this loop eventually recurve or turns. Okay, so this one. Mm -hmm. There. We have there the shoulder of a loop. It's like with the uh, human body, the location of a shoulder of a human of a human here so that is what you call the shoulder of the loop next here is we have here the appendage it is a short ridge at the top or the summit of a particular recurve wherein it is usually at right angle so this is our appendage they are usually at right angle and it is located on the top or summit of a recurving ridge here. So those are considered as appendage. 
Next is we have here the sufficient recurve. It consists of the space between the shoulders of a loop. And take note when we talk about sufficient recurve, it must be free from any appendage attached to it at right angle. Or uh, there is no appendage which are outside the recurve, just like this one. Once or if there is a presence of an appendage in a particular recurving ridge, then it is not sufficient recurve. It is already spoiled. Next is the envelope. It is a single recurving ridge ridge wherein it encloses one or more rods or bars. In other words, when we talk about envelope, it is the innermost recurving ridge wherein take note that it must enclose one or more rods. When we talk about rods, Rad is a single ending ridge at the center of a recurving ridge of a pattern. So this is the rad and this is the envelope. Okay, so take note, a rad should be inside a recurving ridge and the envelope is enclosing or the innermost recurving ridge which encloses the rad or bar. So, I repeat, this is the rod and this is the envelope. Okay. This is a rod and this is the envelope. There. Next is we have here the aftras. It is actually an ending ridge of any length wherein it rises at a sufficient degree from the horizontal plane. So, for example, this one. Okay. These are uh, up thrusts, okay? An ending ridge wherein it rises at a certain uh, degree from the horizontal plane. Okay. So, these are the ending ridge it rises from the horizontal plane. Okay, so moving on with our discussion, next is we have here the type lines and the pattern area. So from this figure, we are going to identify where is the type line and where is the pattern area. Okay, so when we talk type lines, these are two innermost ridges where in they serve as the basic boundary of the pattern area. And uh, it starts parallel, then diverge, wherein it surrounds or tend to surround the pattern area. Just like this one, the uh, thicker lines. Okay, these are the, this is considered as the pipeline, the two innermost ridges. And it serves as the boundary of the pattern area. So the pattern area lies within the area wherein it is surrounded by pipelines. So this uh, is our pattern area and this is our pipelines. See, these are the boundaries of the pattern area. So all of this part are considered the pattern area, this particular part the inner part. Take note that type lines are not always two continuous ridges, just like this one. Okay, these are continuous type lines. Now, uh, sometimes they are also broken. Okay. So, take note that if there is a break in the type line, the ridge is uh, will immediately proceed with the outside ridge, which is considered as the continuation of the type line until it tends to surround the pattern area. So these are considered as the outside part. Okay, there. 
we have here the type lines. These are broken. Okay. So moving on. Likewise, the arms of a bifurcation on which the delta is located cannot be used for type lines. For example, this one. It is considered as the two innermost. Uh, it is considered under the two innermost ridges. However, if this is a bifurcation on which uh, the delta, or we are going to place here the delta, it cannot be used as type line. So in this scenario, this will serve as our type line. Okay. The same also with this uh, second uh, example. This will be considered as type line not this one because it will be used as delta okay so these are the type line this will be the delta of this uh, fingerprint so angles cannot be considered for type lines just like this one okay this angle particular angle cannot be considered as type line so our type lines in this figure will be this one Okay, these are our type lines, but not the uh, angles, okay, even this one, these are considered angles, so our type lines would be this one. These angles actually will also be used as our delta also, just like in the uh, bifurcation, okay, so this is our type line. For our next topic is we have here the two focal points of fingerprint. These two focal points actually serve as the initiatory in the classification of fingerprints whether this is an arch, a loop, or a whirl pattern. So these are the two things that is the uh, first that you need to determine before proceeding with the classification of fingerprint. The core is a point on a ridge formation which are usually located at the center or heart of a pattern area, whereas the delta is the point on the first ridge formation which is directly at or in front or nearest the center of divergence of the type lines. So for example is this in this particular figure. So we have there. The uh, core in this particular figure is located on the center or heart of the pattern area. So for example this one. This will now be considered as the uh, core since it is on the heart or uh, center of the pattern we have there. And we have here the delta. Take note, it is a point on the first ridge formation. The first ridge formation that we encounter in this figure is we have here the bifurcation wherein it is considered uh, directly or uh, in front of the uh, point of divergence. When we talk about the point of divergence, this is usually located at which the type lines usually starts to uh, curve or tend to surround the pattern area. So this will be, this particular part is considered the point of divergence. There are also rules that needs to be followed in locating the core. So there are things to be considered. Why is it that, for example, in this figure, why is it that these are considered the core, this uh, particular part? Okay, this are considered the core. So first is, if the innermost recurving ridge contains no rod, it says there, there must be no rod that run as high as the shoulder of the recurving ridge, the core is placed at the shoulder, shoulder farthest the delta. Remember in a recurving ridge, okay, 
when we talk about shoulder of a loop or a recurve, this particular part wherein the ridge formation start to curve will be considered the um, shoulder. Now, uh, we, we are going to identify the two shoulders and then the farthest shoulder from the delta should be considered the core. Here we have here the core. Second is if there is a spike or a rod, this is the rod, okay? This is the rod that we are talking to. It is a single ending ridge inside an envelope. There. Okay, our our core should be located on the spike or rod in the center of the innermost recurve. Provided, take note, it says there, provided that the spike rod rises as high as the shoulders. So in these three examples, the uh, spike or rod runs as high as the shoulder of a loop. Therefore, the location of the core will be on the top or the topmost part of the spike or rod. So this will be the core. Now in this example, since the uh, rod or spike does not run as high as the shoulder of the loop, as we discuss on the first rule, the location of the core must be placed on the shoulder which is farthest to the delta. Okay, so this will be the core in this figure. Next is, uh, if the innermost recurving ridge contains an odd number of rods, wherein it rises, rising as high as the shoulder, take note with this, the core is placed at the top of the center. So for example, in this figure, we have three rods. Okay. Uh, three is an odd number. Now, if these three spikes or three rods runs as high as the shoulder, this is our shoulder. As you can see there, the... Uh, uh, call this if you can see the uh, imaginary lines there they run as high as the shoulder now the location of the core should be placed on the uh, topmost of the uh, topmost part of the uh, center rod okay same with this these are the three rods and this will be the location of the core same with this, even if the core is shorter, I, I mean, even if the rod, the center rod is shorter than the others, as long as it runs as high as the shoulder of the loop, higher than this, shoulders, then this will be the location of the core. Okay, in this example, we have five. Okay, Again, the location of the core is the topmost part of the uh, center spike or rod. Even this one, okay, these are considered three rods and they run as high as the shoulder. So this will be considered our core. Okay. The same with this. Even if it is broken, as long as it is above the shoulder of the loop, above the level of the shoulder of the loop, there. In this particular figure, we can see four, four rods. If you are going to observe this rod, is does not run as high as the shoulder of the loop. Therefore, our core will be located in this part. Okay. This is our core. So this is the sho shoulder. Okay. This is the shoulder of our uh, recurving ridge. There. Oops. My uh, pen is thick. So this is the location of our shoulder. 
and this one does not run as high as the shoulder of a loop. Therefore, I repeat, this now will be the location of the core. The fourth rule in locating the core if the innermost recurving ridge contains an even number of rods arising as high as the shoulder, the core is actually placed at the top of the farthest rod of the suit of the two center rods. For example, in this uh, example, we have two rods. Two is an even number. The uh, farthest Okay, the farthest the farthest rod should be the location of the core, the topmost part. The same with this. There is no problem if we only have two. We only have two rods because you will just place the uh, core on the topmost part of the rod that is farthest to the delta. Okay, in this example or in this figure, we have two. We have two rods. However, the fir the first rod does not run as high as the shoulder of the loop. Therefore, it will not be considered. Now, uh, the location of the core will now be placed here because we only have one. And again, when we have one rod, it is considered as an odd number. And if it is an odd number, it will be located on the topmost part of the spike or the rod. So, next example is this one, the same two. Now, uh, the uh, core is again placed on the farthest, topmost part of the rod. Now, in cases, if we have more than two, but the uh, even number of rods, in this example, we have four. What are you going to do is look on the two innermost rods. We have here the two innermost rods. So, I repeat, locate the two innermost rods. And then, the location of the core is again placed on the farthest, farthest uh, rod or spike. Mm, mali. On the uh, farthest rod. So, the core is located on the farthest rod. Farthest to the delta. The same with this. We have here 2, 4, 6. We have 6. So, we are going to look on the two innermost rod. And then, we are going to place the core on the farthest rod. Topmost part of the farthest rod. Same with this. We have 5. However, the first, this one, does not run as high as the shoulders. So, this rod's will only be counted. So, in this example, we have 4. Now, the location of the core will be on the uh, topmost part of the farthest rod. So, how about here? Where is the location of the core in this particular example? We have there. This is the location of the core. So, how many rods run as high as the shoulder of a loop? We have here. Um, we have four. We have only four. This only part will be counted because they run as high as the shoulder of the loop. We only have four. And again, this is the location of the core. Same with this. Uh, this will be the shoulder. Okay. So, this was not touched and we only have two. Uh, rods so the location of our core will be this one and the same through with this our shoulder is this okay and uh, this we have here the location of the core next is the interlocking loops we have here the interlocking loops just like the on the pictures shown to you so what are you going to do is join first the two loops by drawing an imaginary recurve. You need to determine the uh, shoulder, outside shoulder of these two interlocking loops and then make an imaginary recurve. Now, this uh, will be considered as the rods inside and then count 
as you can see we have here two we can see two rods already they are now considered as rods so if we have two again the core will be placed on the farthest rod next is we have here again draw an imaginary line determine the outside shoulder of the two loops and then join together now it created only one rod and of course when we have only one rod it is placed on the topmost part okay next is we have here also again uh, interlocking loops again draw an imaginary recurve and then we have here two considered two rods this now will be the location of the core the same with this okay again join again the two interlocking and then determine where is the location of the core so this will now be our core now in this example also we are going to draw an imaginary recurve to join the two interlocking loop not actually interlocking but we have two loops so this will be considered rods we have there two the location again of the core will be the farthest rod the same with this okay. in this particular example we have there we need to draw an imaginary recurve first and then again determine the shoulder outside shoulder now in this particular example the two were touched so we are now going to count the rods one two three and four and determine the innermost again apply the rule number four okay we are going to determine the two innermost uh, rod and then the topmost of the farthest rod will be considered the core so this will be the location of our core okay now let us proceed with delta formations so before we proceed in the rules in locating the delta uh, we are we should be able to determine what are those considered uh, delta formations so first we have there the bifurcation so in this example the bifurcation is here again before you proceed or you determine the delta you need to determine first the pipeline so this is the pipeline and this is the first uh, ridge formation in between the pipelines so this will be our delta so we have here the delta as our uh, we have here bifurcation as our delta next is it can be a dot ridge so again this is our delta the first ridge formation Next is a short ridge. So in a short ridge, um, locate the ending ridge of a short ridge, which is nearest to the point of divergence. Remember the point of divergence is in here. So the location of Delta will be this. And next of course is we have there the meeting of two ridges, which are considered a Delta. So for example, in this uh, scenario, these are considered the pipeline this one remember on the rules again as we have discussed a while ago the uh, meeting of two ridges or the converge uh, if these uh, ridges converge at one another it will not be considered as delta so we have there okay this will be the location of our delta the point where the uh, uh, ridge meet with one another another is an abrupt ending so there is an abrupt ending here or an ending ridge in here this will be the location of the delta okay. next is uh, we have here the uh, other example again uh, we have here two ending ridge this one and this one you need to consider the point of divergence so this ending ridge is the uh, is nearer to the point of divergence than this one so this will be the location of our delta next will be a point on the first recurving ridge located or nearest to the center or in front of the divergence of the pipelines so if this 
is the uh, point of divergence, then the location of delta will be in here. So if you're going to observe, there are no bifurcation, there is no that. But then we need to consider now the uh, point of divergence, okay? the center. The center of divergence will now be considered as the delta. So to speak, uh, we have stated this is the point of divergence. Now, if there will be no other ridge formations like the things that we have discussed, for example, the meeting of two ridges, the bifurcation, no that ridge, or uh, there is no abrupt ending, then the location of the delta will be the uh, point of, will be the uh, center of divergence. This will be the location of the delta. So again, when we talk about divergence, this is the area to be considered in front of the point of divergence. The point of divergence that we are talking is the this one, the point where in the uh, pipelines tend to uh, diverge. First rule in locating the delta is if there are two or more possible bifurcation which conforms to the definition, then the one that is nearest to the core should be chosen. So for example, this one we have there three bifurcation. The uh, nearest bifurcation to the core will be considered our delta. So this will be our delta. The same with this, we have two bifurcations. In here, we also have two bifurcations. The one nearest to the core will be considered delta. The same with this. We have there three bifurcations. And uh, the location of our delta will be this one. Since it is nearer to the core. We also have there the abutting uh, ridges. Again, this will be the location of the delta. Because in this particular part, these are considered abutting ridges, meaning the uh, split or uh, the bifurcation does not open towards the core. So this will be the location of the delta. The next rule is the delta may not be located in the middle of a ridge that runs between the pipelines toward the core, but at the end nearest to the core. What do you mean by this? It is not located in the middle of a ridge. So not totally the middle, not in here. Just like in this example. Okay. But uh, as long as it is, it runs towards the... This is applicable if there is no uh, bifurcation. So in cases, we have here ending ridge and we have there converging ridge. So, the location of the delta will be on the, uh, in between the pipelines, wherein it is uh, near to the core. For example, this one, this will be considered as the delta and not this one. Okay. The same also with this. We have two ending ridge. However, the ending ridge that is nearer to the core will be considered the delta. In this particular example, wherein this is a meeting of two ridges, the location will be on the part wherein the ridges actually meets with one another. The same with this. And in this example, again, this is an ending ridge. The one nearest to the core will be the delta. Now, in this particular example, why is it that this delta is located here, but the problem is in our rule, it says there it should be nearest to the core. Again, consider the point of divergence. Okay, our point, this particular part or this ending ridge, although it is nearer to the core, but it is already outside the point of divergence. So these are the things that needs to be considered. Next rule is that the delta may not be located or placed on a bifurcation that did not open up toward the bottom area. So for example, in this particular example, we have here 
the uh, for example this is a bifurcation there the it, it splits on the uh, bottom area therefore the location of the delta will now be the uh, that ridge I repeat if the bifurcation splits towards the bottom area it will not be considered already so in this example the uh, considered delta is the dot ridge because it is in the center of the point of divergence the same with this this is actually a bifurcation however our delta is not located here because uh, again uh, the next thing that we need to consider is the point of divergence so our point of divergence is here so our delta will be here the same with this so although we again have here the uh, delta formation i mean the uh, bifurcation the delta is located on the center in this uh, ending ridge on the center of the point of divergence the same with this although we have here bifurcation since they they split towards the bottom area then our delta will be this one again the consideration here is the point of divergence the same with this this are actually a bifurcation but our delta was not located here because in this delta rule the uh, consideration is that the bifurcation is open towards the bottom area therefore the uh, next to be considered is the point of divergence there and uh, we have here the ending reach here so this will be considered the delta the last rule in delta is uh, where there is a choice between bifurcation for instance we have a lot of uh, bifurcation to be considered meaning there is a dot there is a converging ridge or meeting of two lines then the priority to be selected as delta will be bifurcation for example is this in this example we have a bifurcation and at that ridge the priority should be the bifurcation so this will be our delta next is we have here a short ridge and a bifurcation so we are going to consider first the bifurcation the same with this we have there an ending ridge and a bifurcation so we are going to consider the bifurcation again as the delta the same with this okay and of course this we have here meeting of two lines and we have their bifurcation again the priority of uh, selecting the delta is under the rules should be a bifurcation so this will be our delta now what if there are series of uh, um, ridge formation such as the uh, dot ridge or the uh, meeting of two ridges and there will be no um, bifurcation the next to be considered is the dot ridge so i repeat the first priority to be considered if there are series of uh, bifurcation to be considered is uh, we need to prioritize the bifurcation if not second will be the that ridge so i hope you have uh, learned from this video and if you like this video please click like button and subscribe thank you for watching